think about boys, like my daughter is 11 turning 12, so you guys remember this time in your life where everything changes. And I'll tell you, no boys ever chose me. My best friends, they got chosen. I remember distinctly. Me, little old me, not so much. Math club, absolutely not. Sports, forget about it. No one asked me to sing or dance up here for a good reason. So when you think about being chosen, different things might come to mind. But we have all been chosen at some time or another, right? And when you are chosen, how does it feel? Super good. You feel special. You feel seen. You feel acknowledged or validated, right? All good things. So I'm going to share a couple definitions with you guys. So to be chosen as a noun is one who is the object of choice. That sounds pretty nice. As an adjective, it's having been selected as the best or most appropriate, or to be selected from several, or even simpler, preferred. That sounds nice, right? I always want to be the preferred. So today we're going to study out the book of Esther. It's a short book. It's about 10 chapters. You can read it in one sitting, pretty easy. A little bit of background for you guys. You probably are mo most of you are probably familiar at least. You've heard, the, you've heard the name. You know it's in the Bible somewhere. I'm going to give you a little bit of background, a little bit of history. So it's only one of two books in the Bible that are named after a woman. A woman. So that's already special. It's Esther and then Ruth. It was written in about 483 B.C. As I said, it's only 10 chapters long. And the, the 10 chapters, it just recounts the story of the rise of this beautiful young orphan girl from obscurity to royalty. It's got all the stuff that we want. It's got like the drama, it's got like the action, maybe a romance depending on how you look at it. And uh, we're gonna study out our main character, Esther. It takes place in Persia, which is modern day Iran. And uh, have any of you guys seen the movie 300? Or you've heard of it, right? With Gerard Butler, I know <laughs> some of you guys have seen it. It's a real favorite amongst the men especially. So the movie 300, I've never seen it, but I did watch the trailer. It looked way too intense for me. And the movie 300, it's all about King Xerxes, the, the Persian king, and his failed attempt to invade and conquer Greece. The 300 Spartans led by Gerard Butler, they rise up and miraculously are able to withstand the much larger Persian empire. And so the, the Xerxes in our story is the Xerxes that you would see in that movie 300. So that's pretty cool. I'm not saying go back, go out and watch it. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but King Xerxes is not the, he's not Gerard Butler. He's the, he's the bad guy in the movie, okay? He's the antagonist. <laughs> but it's the same King Xerxes. So at this point in the book of Esther, the Persian Empire is the largest it's ever been. It's the, it's the largest empire the world had ever seen. So that's the, that's the kind of... Uh, that's a scene that we're going to step into. And we're going to start in Esther chapter 1 in verse 1. If you brought a Bible, please feel free to follow along. Or if you have a Bible app on your phone, you can pull that up. We are going to read a good chunk of Esther. Come on, Come on, Come on, so in Esther chapter 1 verse 1, the Bible reads, This is what happened during the time of King Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Cush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials, the military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes, and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. Look down at verse 8. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. Okay, so we're going to pause there. Our story picks up, and King Xerxes is in the throes of a 180-day wild party. He's got all of his military leaders. He's got all of his government officials. And right after that 180 days, he has a seven-day party for all the, the citizens that live in the capital of Susa. That's the capital of the Persian Empire. So as you can imagine, this is, would get pretty wild, right? There's going to be a lot of drinking because there's no limitations on how much they could consume. And, you know, we're going to think about what that would look like. So hundreds, if not thousands of men drinking with no limitations. There's going to be some serious shenanigans. Let's keep reading and see what happens in verse 9. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. 
On the tenth day, when King Xerxes was high in spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Okay, so we're going to pause there. We learned that Queen Vashti wasn't present. She's holding her own party for the women. That's pretty cool. But then in their little, you know, friendly tea party, seven eunuchs show up with a message from the king. And what's their message? Hey, the king wants you to come and display your beauty in front of all of his drunk friends. And if you, if you read commentaries on this, most commentators agree that it's not just that he wanted her to come display her beauty. They, they speculate that he wanted her to come naked and display her beauty, wearing only her crown. No, thank you. I don't care how good looking you are. <laughs> that is not a good idea. So assuming that's true, I believe Vashti had enough sense to know that not only is that immodest and indecent, but it's also very unwise. Why? Like you're this beautiful woman. If you were arguably the most beautiful woman in 127 provinces, would that be a good idea to just, you know, nakedly prance down in front of all these drunk men? So Lord only knows what problems could have arisen if she would have done that. So she says no. King, uh, King Xerxes gets really upset. He feels disrespected. He solicits input from his buddies, and he says, what do we do? What should we do about this? And they say, hey, how about this? Uh, revoke her queenship, kick her out, and write a law saying she can never come before you again. And he says, that's what I'll do. And so Vashti is deposed. She's kicked out. She can never see the king again. And now we're going to be introduced to our main character in Esther chapter 2, verse 1. It says, later, when King Xerxes' fury had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful young women into the harem at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the, the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women, and let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Ashti. This advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. Verse 5. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai. Skip to verse 7. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. So when I read this, I don't know if this stuck out to you guys too, but I was like, wow, the Persians were really concerned with physical beauty. <laughs> There's like such an emphasis on beauty, which leads me to my first point, more than just a pretty face. And I tell you, I look around and I see hundreds of beautiful faces, really and truly. Each of you look very different, very unique. You're all different sizes, shades, ages, and you're beautiful. Just like Queen Vashti and just like Esther. And I know I say that and some of you are like, oh, thanks, yeah, I tried really hard. <laughs> And some of you are like, uh-huh, <laughs> right. Because I think the truth is, as women, we can so easily wrap our worth up in how people view us, what we look like. If you feel skinny, you're having a good day. If you have a breakout, you're having a bad day. And don't even think about asking how we feel the first day of our periods, right? <laughs> Game over. Don't look at me. <laughs> don't talk to me. I don't know. I'd like to say it gets easier, but I can't say that's true. So our culture and our society, it really doesn't help us with this, right? And some of you women with wisdom would tell us younger women, I still consider myself young. I turned 40 this year. But I still use a little social media, Facebook, that dates me. But you know when you go on TikTok, you know when you go on Instagram and whatever else you young people use? I know we know this by now, but those are people's highlights, right? That's the best they look. You don't see people posting like their lowlights. No, 
they don't always look like that. Just like, I don't always dress like this. <laughs> this is special for you guys. And when people post, that's special for them too. And even though we know this is true, I think it still consciously affects us. Yeah. I think we still look at their highlight and then our average, and then we think, ugh, I'll never dot, 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 look like that, be able to bake like that, pack my kids' lunches like that. That's what happens when you're a mom. <laughs> That's what you think about. And we, we are affected, whether it's consciously or unconsciously. I really believe that. And it's besides the point. I just want you guys to ponder that. But back to our text. Who is this young woman, Esther? Well, first of all, we know she was young. We know she was beautiful. We know she was a virgin. We know she was an orphan. And we know she was a Jewess. So that's who Esther was. Now, ancient Jewish tradition holds that about 400 beautiful young virgins were selected in all 127 provinces that King Xerxes ruled over. So visualize with me a Miss Persian Empire pageant. The most beautiful, and these are exotic looking women, right? Like, and these women are chosen. They didn't sign up, they didn't enlist. No, you're pretty, you come. You're pretty, you come. Can you imagine? That's what this was. Esther did not have a choice. There's no choice in what was happening. None of these women had a choice. They were beautiful, so they were solicited to come. And they were taken from their homes and their families to be presented to Xerxes. And this is a, a competition to cheer up the king after losing Vashti. That's what all this is for. Look, let's look at Esther chapter 2, verse 12. It says, before a young woman's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women. Six months with oil and myrrh, and six with perfumes and cosmetics. Wow. A whole year of beauty treatments. As the mother of a three-year-old boy, I tell you, that sounds like heaven. <laughs> Absolute luxury. But what does it actually mean, guys? It means, realistically, these, these 400 beautiful young women, these virgins who had never been with a man, they would each spend one whole year, 365 days, getting ready. And then they would finally get their turn to get one night with the king. That's it. And whomever the king chose would be the next queen. Some might think this sounds romantic. There's a movie that was made in 2006 called One Night with a King, and it definitely romanticizes what happened. But when I read this, and I think about what that actually looks like for those other 399 women, it doesn't sound romantic to me. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, what would happen to those other 399, these, the most beautiful women of, of the area? Were they free to go back home to their families? They were not. These women, after their one night with the king, obviously they're no longer virgins, they would be sent to live in his harem as either wives or concubines. They could not go back to their families. They could not go back to their countries. They were not free to move on with their lives and marry someone else, and they could not bear their own families and build their own homes. They had to stay in King Xerxes' harem, where very likely they would never see him again. That's pretty sad, if you think about it. So Esther, She's our, our orphan Jewess. Here's where God's providence really begins to shine. She is chosen of those 400 drop-dead, gorgeous, exotic-looking Persian women to be the next queen of Persia. We're going to read Esther 2, verse 15 through 18. It says, when the turn came for Esther to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. So she was humble. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. Now the king was more attracted to Esther than any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Ashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. This is pretty incredible. Esther is the one who is picked. How did Esther feel being picked? How did she feel being chosen? I imagine she must have been totally shocked, right? I imagine she was probably in disbelief. Did she feel honored? Did she feel special? Did she feel seen? Did she feel preferred? Or did she feel like a piece of meat? We don't know. Was she flattered 
or was she offended? We can only speculate. But I'll tell you that I've been a Christian for 19 years, and 12 of those years I've been in the ministry. Means I've studied the Bible with literally hundreds of women. Hundreds of women. And I have found some pretty common things to be true for the vast majority of us. We all want to be chosen. We all want to be preferred. We all want to be the one that is seen and validated. And most of us, despite all of our best efforts, do not actually feel chosen. We don't actually feel like we are the preferred one. The amount of women who have deep hurts from their past is extensive. Sometimes these hurts are right on the surface. You can interact with someone for a few minutes and you realize, oh, they got baggage. Sometimes they're deep down. They're very deep. Sometimes the hurts came from family members, your parents, your siblings. Other times it came through a man. Oftentimes it came through a man. I relate to both of these things, to be honest with you. Although I grew up in a Christian home with Christian morals and values, I was anything but Christian from about 12 to 21. I was deeply insecure. I relate very much to what both Anika and Cindy shared for different reasons, but I believe we can all relate to some degree. There's a deep amount of insecurity that we as women battle on a very regular basis. I was insecure because I never felt chosen. But as I said, when I said like it was always my best friend, they always had like a line of guys. And me, nobody ever wanted to have anything to do with me. That affected me very deeply. I was constantly comparing myself to other women. So the first man that paid attention to me, that like picked me, that was it. That was it. I was like, well, okay, I mean, I'm a little young, but you know, I'm probably gonna marry him. I, I didn't think anything about it. And that's being raised as a Christian, right? And as Cindy shared, that man became my whole world. My whole world. You guys can relate. Many of you can relate. So I was where he was. People ask me what my, my plans are. I'd be like, hey, I don't know. What are our plans? Right? They were, they were totally tied to this man. And we ended up dating for several years. We lived together after high school. And when we broke up, I had no idea who I was anymore. My identity was so wrapped up in this relationship. I had an identity crisis at like 19 years old. I was constantly comparing myself to other women, as Cindy shared. Sometimes I came out on top. Most of the time, I came out on the bottom. I feel like I could not measure up to the women around me. They were all thinner, prettier, clearer skin, better hair, whatever. And it really wasn't until I sat down and studied the Bible at 21 years old that the way I thought and the way I saw men and people really began to change. It was the first time I'd ever let the scriptures be applied to me. Boy, was that different. It was the first time I took time to stop and reflect. It was hard to look inside. It was the first time I let women in. As uh, I don't know if it was Cindy or Anika shared, but women have, have challenges with women relationships. I cannot tell you how many women I saw the Bible that says, yeah, I get along better with men than women. Over half. <laughs> That's the reality is because women, we can be catty, right? We can be hard, and it's, it all comes from a place of insecurity. But I, let, I sat down with women, and I opened up to them. Like, at first, like, very, like this. It was very painful. I shared things about myself I'd never shared with anybody else and never planned to. And what happened was I didn't realize how much junk was actually in there. Ugh, it was hard. See, my childhood, it wasn't terrible by any stretch of the imagination, but it wasn't perfect. There were definitely hurts. So as I told you guys, I'm the youngest of three. I definitely felt loved by my mom and my stepdad. My dad wasn't really in my life, but I think because my mom remarried when I was so young, I had that father figure. But my family changed when my sister was about 15 and I was about 10 years old. She started getting into trouble. And I don't want to say my sister was like my idol or my hero, but like she's my, she's my only big sister, right? It affects a girl. She started getting in trouble with boys. She started getting in trouble using drugs. She started getting in trouble, you know, running away, hanging out with the wrong crowd. And she was about 15 when she started using hard drugs, really hard drugs. It caused intense amount of stress on my family. 
And there was a lot of yelling, a lot of screaming, a lot of, you know, kicking out and dragging and just stress, physical altercations, things that I just remember hiding in my closet. It was way too much stress for a little 10-year-old me to handle. And so the truth is my sister was strung out for a lot of my uh, life, honestly. She was in prison when I was pregnant with my daughter. You know, she's, so thank God she's, she's sober now and she's incredible and she's the best auntie in the world. But, you know, it was a very hard time in my life. And if you have any addicts in your family, in your life, you understand what comes along with addiction. There's a lot of lying. There's a lot of stealing. There's a lot of using your social security number, having cops come and see if you have tattoos because this person that uses your social security number and identity has tattoos. You get the picture, right? And then my brother, who's 14 months older than me, he also started to get into a lot of trouble. I think he probably was in about the seventh grade. He got into drugs and alcohol. So my on my dad's side of the family, there's a, a long line of alcohol abuse. And uh, my brother would have violent outbursts. He'd be very rough with me. One time he got mad because I was a smart mouth. And he, he just walked straight out to my car and ripped my whole car stereo system out and just dropped it on the ground. OK. <laughs> I was a senior in high school when he took my car, drunk, wrecked it into a telephone pole, and walked home. None of these things were ever apologized for. None of these things were never, like, I never got paid back for any of these things. None of these things were never even acknowledged, because that's how my family dealt with stuff, by never talking about it. I don't remember having any conversations about these things. It was like nothing had ever happened. And so that's how I functioned. Nothing, nothing happens. And so I dealt with all the stress by just totally shutting down. Imagine a 10-year-old me, and I remember going to see The Lion King when it came out in the theaters, and I remember wanting to cry so bad when Mufasa died, but I couldn't. I couldn't. I stopped crying. Before that, my heart was hard, and even though I was so sad, the emotions could not come out. I had a fortified wall. Man, nothing was getting in here. Nothing was going to phase me. And none of this was conscious. I didn't do any of this stuff consciously. This was all subconscious. And we all deal with pain differently. We all deal with trauma differently. And maybe you can't relate. Maybe you, know, you're, maybe you have the picture-perfect family, or maybe your family was 20 times worse than mine. We all dealt with it one way or another. And I thought I was dealing with it, and I come to realize, not at all. So I don't think I ever consciously put together how I felt in my family dynamic. See, I was the good one. And to be honest with you guys, I was not good by any stretch of the imagination. I wasn't good. Like, you, if, if you saw, like, you know, eighth grade me, you'd be like, oh, Lord, please don't let that be my daughter. You know, I, I was not good. But comparatively, because I'm not strung out on drugs and, you know, going to jail for drinking and driving, I was good because I still got good grades. I still went to school. I went to school high, but I still went to school. And I think my parents were so overwhelmed, they couldn't, they couldn't even, like, deal with anything. So I think they just thought I was an angel and let me go on doing whatever because they were so maxed out with my brother and my sister. And I think that deep down, I felt like they chose to focus on my siblings and their problems and they had no time or energy or mental capacity left to deal with anything with me. I didn't blame them at all, but it still affected me. Yeah. And so pick back up to 21 year old me sitting down and studying the Bible, opening up my life I had no idea all this stuff was in there. I had not the slightest idea. I just thought I was like kind of a hard person. Like, you know, I'd walk into a room and I'd look mad. <laughs> People didn't want to talk to me, right? I wasn't trying to be like that, maybe, maybe a little bit. Because I didn't want to look insecure, you know, so you kind of put on a mad face. I don't know if any of you are, relate to that at all. It, it can be a little intimidating coming to a room of like 300 plus women and like, you know. So put on your mad face, don't do that. Now when I don't know what to do, I just smile. <laughs> But, you know, when I'm studying the Bible, I remember how unnerving it felt. I remember there were times I wanted to, like, lash out in anger. I remember there were times that I just wanted to run away. I did not want to deal with this stuff. And I remember they kept asking questions. I remember the woman that said to the Bible, me, she'd ask me how I felt about my family dynamics. How did I feel about my sister being in prison? How did I feel? And I was like, I don't know. It's just life. Like, let it go. Move on. You want me to cry about it? And she was just like, whoa. But I didn't run away as much as I wanted to. 
and I stuck it out. And I stand before you guys 100% confident that it was the best thing I ever did. Not run away, even though I wanted to. And as I said, like we've all been through stuff, some more than others. And then remember Esther? She'd been through some stuff. Like Esther didn't ask to be an orphan, and we don't know how her parents died. She didn't ask to be raised in this pagan nation of Persia. She didn't ask to have, to be beautiful. She didn't ask to have this rockin' hot bod. She didn't ask for any of this stuff. <laughs> and we don't know what her childhood was like, but we know she didn't ask to be taken to the king's harem, and she didn't ask to be made queen. Esther was chosen by Xerxes, but even more so, she was chosen by God. God was choosing Esther. He had a much bigger plan, a much bigger purpose for Esther. So much bigger than just becoming queen. That was just like the tip of the iceberg. It was not just so she could have an easier life or you know, so that she could just live a better life. God chose Esther, but he's also chosen us. Right. And the whole Bible, cover to cover, is really just a love story of how much God's chosen you of how much God wants a relationship with you and with me. And I'd love to share a passage with you in Isaiah 43. It's one of my favorites. And I encourage you to really fight to hear this as though God were speaking it to you because it expresses his immense love and care for you. In Isaiah 43, verse 1, the Bible reads, But now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, he who formed you, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom. Cush and Seba in your stead, since you are precious and honored in my sight. And because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. My friends, regardless of what you think, regardless of what you're told, regardless of what you've heard your whole life, this is how God feels about you. He says you are his, he'll be with you, you're precious, you're honored, he loves you, and he would give other people's lives in exchange for you. That's an incredible love story. You're chosen. And just as Esther was more than a pretty face, you're more than a pretty face as well. Although, I know some of you, and I look at you and I think, you're beautiful, but that's not it. Which leads me to my second point, more than just an average life. Let's get back to our text in Esther, and we'll turn the bend here. For time's sake, I'm going to do a little bit of summarizing. You can go back and read the whole story on your own. In Esther 3, we're introduced to Haman. He's the antagonist in our story. He's the bad guy. And so King Xerxes, now Esther's husband, he promotes Haman to be the second most powerful man in the whole kingdom. And Haman is an Agagite. The Agagites are the sworn enemies of the Jews, God's chosen people. So immediately there is trouble that a bruise between Mordecai, a devout Jew, follower of God, and the evil Haman. Haman is so offended that Mordecai won't bow down and like honor him. And you know, a man with wounded pride can do pretty foolish things. He's so offended by Mordecai that he decides he wants to kill Mordecai, but not just Mordecai. He wants to kill all the Jews in the whole Persian Empire. It's the first Holocaust. Haman devises a plan and how he's going to do this. And he convinces Xerxes. He kind of frames it in a way that says, hey, these guys cause trouble. They're kind of scattered throughout the province. We should probably just kill them all. Xerxes says, okay, these guys are called, causing problems. I trust your judgment. Let's kill them all. And so at this time, no one knew that Esther was a Jew because Mordecai had forbidden her to tell anyone. And she was still in obedience to him as, as like her dad. So King Xerxes writes it out. The edict goes out that all the Jews are going to be killed on this one day. And not only can you kill them, you can also take all of their stuff. And as you can imagine, everyone is shocked. Like, what the heck just happened? Where did this come from? So we're going to pick it up in chapter 4, where Mordecai 
sends messengers to let Queen Esther know what's going on, because Esther hasn't heard yet. And Mordecai is urging Esther to go before the king to put a stop to this, to use her, use her you know, role now as a wife, as a queen, to beg for mercy. So in Esther 4, verse 11, we're going to read Esther's response. All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death, unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words are reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you were in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. That's our theme scripture. Wow. So Esther tells Mordecai why she can't go. She says, if I go to the king unsolicited and he's not happy, I'll be put to death. That's a rough marriage. Mordecai compels her to go anyway. And he says, hey, don't think you can save your skin. Don't think that you know, you're going you're gonna to make it out of this. He says, if you remain silent, God's going to provide relief from somewhere else. But who knows that the whole reason you're in the palace is for such a time as this. See, God had a much bigger purpose for Esther. She agrees to do it, and she's fully surrendered that if this goes south, it'll cost her her life. Now, it's a good, it's a good ending. She succeeds. She, go, she does go before the king, and she's surrendered, but he extends the gold scepter, and he says, what do you want, Esther? And ultimately, she's able to plead for her life and the life of all the Jews. King Xerxes says, well, I can't take it back because I've already signed the law, but what do you want me to do? And so she says, well, just, just let the Jews fight back. Just let them defend themselves. And he says, sure. So another you know, edict law goes out that says, hey, on this day, the Jews can defend themselves. And they are you know, incredibly successful. And instead of a holocaust, they are able to defeat their enemies. So God works it out for the good. Absolutely. But, you know, you think about your life. Think about the things that you've been through. Have you ever wondered, like, why? Why me? Why is this my life situation? Have you ever wondered, why did I have to go through this? What's even the point? Have you ever wondered, what's the point of my whole life? What is the purpose? What am I doing here? Have you ever thought there must be more? Like, have you ever thought, is this really all there is? There's gotta be more. I think most of us have had these thoughts at least one time or another, right? Maybe you don't like to ask such deep questions. I'm not a super deep person myself. But some of you are deep and you lay in bed at night and these things keep you up. <laughs> I just knock straight out. <laughs> but sometimes life gets so busy that we don't want to stop and think about these things, right? But I think that deep down we all know that there's more. This can't be it. This can't be all. I've been through these things for a reason. I'm living in this place for a reason. There's got to be something more. And the truth is, there is. There is so much more that God has created you for. Have you ever been somewhere where there was a lot of people and you just felt really insignificant? Like you're just like a little drop in the bucket? Like that's how I felt when I went to New York City. You guys ever been to New York City? Lord have mercy. There are so many people in New York City and they're going so many different directions and they're all going so fast. They're all in a hurry. Why? Why are East Coasters always in a hurry? But I remember feeling so insignificant. Like, oh my gosh, I'm like an ant on a hill. I'm, I'm, I'm nothing. And we can be tempted to feel that way with our lives. But the reality is we all have a reason for being on this planet. God doesn't make mistakes. Not one of us is insignificant. He had a bigger purpose for Esther, and he has a bigger purpose for you. Before I sit down and study the Bible, I had no idea what my purpose was. As I said, I'm not a deep thinker. Those are not things that keep me awake at night. But if you would have asked me, and I would have said, I don't know, and if you would have pressured me, I would have been like, well, I guess to get a degree and, you know, then get a job with the National Geographic because I studied journalism and I'm going to go to exotic places. And then when I want to slow down, I'm going to get married and have 2.5 kids, get a nice house and, you know, have a great career. Okay, what? Leave me alone. And all that sounds pretty decent, right? That sounds okay. That's not, all, that's not bad, except 2.5 kids. That's not possible. But never in a million years would I imagine like, what God was actually going to do in my life. 
never in a million years. Like, there's nothing in me that would ever want to stand up before hundreds of women and put myself out there. <laughs> that's, not, that's not who I am in my nature. And if you would have told me God was going to call you to, to work in this capacity, I would have said, <laughs> that's awkward. <sighs> I'm an awkward person. I enjoy being awkward. But the reality is, once I opened up my heart to the scriptures and I let them take root, it did some pretty profound things on me. I let him go to work, and he did his work. And I believe that that's what God wants his word to do for all of us. He wants it to be able to take root, to penetrate. And when you do it, you will seek things that God wants you to change, as I did, as Cindy shared, as Anika shared. That's called repentance. I always thought repentance was feeling really, really bad about doing the same stupid thing over and over. That's not repentance. Repentance is actually changing. God wants us to change. Studying the Bible showed me how to change. I never thought it was possible, as Cindy shared. I never would have thought it was possible to have a pure relationship with a man. That's crazy. And yet, God's word shows us how to do that. I never thought so many things would be possible that I could change, that I could give up, and yet God's word shows us actually how to do it. And not only that we should, but that we're called to. It's not just a good idea in theory, right, which is what I thought growing up. You just try your best to be like a good Christian, you know, but God understands. That's how I felt. God understands. He knows. It's like, it's way different now. That was like 2,000 years ago. It's like different times. No, but he does help you to obey. I saw that I couldn't just pray these things away. You can't just pray it away, you know? I couldn't just pray away my guilty conscience. I couldn't just pray away my hangover from the night before. I saw from scriptures like Acts 2.38 and Romans 6 that I needed to repent. I needed to be baptized, get my sins forgiven if I wanted to be raised to that new life. And after wrestling with the scriptures, I really surrendered like Esther did. And I said, if this is what God wants me to do, then this is what I'm going to do. God chose me, but it's not just me. Getting married on March 24, 2007 was amazing. I've been to a lot of weddings. Mine was the best. <laughs> I'm serious. We had steak. We had chicken. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Having my daughter, January 11, 2012, life-changing. Talk about bringing human life in the world. It changes you. Having my son, December 7, 2019, an answered prayer. This is the most sweetest child you will ever meet. And those are important days in my life. But October 31st, 2004 was and still is the best day of my life. The day I made Jesus Lord of my life and was baptized, I surrendered wholly, fully, truly to God. I embraced that he was choosing me and that he was the only one who truly mattered. See, Esther, her story is so powerful, not because she was chosen by King Xerxes, but because she was chosen by God. And even if I'm never chosen to do a special song up here for you, <laughs> even if I'm never chosen for a big promotion, even if I'm never asked to be on your team for something or another, even if I never get the Mom of the Year Award or the Wife of the Year Award or anything else, I am chosen. I'm chosen by the creator of the universe. And nothing could ever mean more than that. I pray that you all will take the challenge to study the Bible. If you have never yet done that, do it now. What do you have to lose? I pray that you will see what God's word really has to say to you. And I believe you'll find that you also were chosen for such a time as this. Thank you.